here. Um, yeah, so a um, <clears throat> few things that we want to talk about. Yeah, as Miles said, I think there's a lot of exciting stuff that's going to happen, making it much more game-like um, today. Uh, we're going to start looking at collisions um, and, and really thinking about events. Um, so the idea that something happens at a given moment in time um, and doing something in response to that. Uh, because so far, really, almost uh, most of the things that we've been doing are kind of like just happen out there at any time. Like the keyboard is waiting for you to press a key at any moment and going to move the character in response to that. Um, but then we're going to be sort of looking at what happens in these specific cases when even though those are really our types of events. Uh, but we're going to be looking at these specific things when like your your hero runs into a target. What do you want to have happen and how do you want to make that stuff happen? And how do you keep track of that through scores and, and stuff um, that makes the whole the whole environment feel a little bit more friendly and familiar um, rather than just sort of this abstract JavaScript experiment. Um, what I wanted to start actually with though for a second was to be thinking about um, um, just taking a step back because we're starting to get into into some um, where these code examples that we're giving you um, have um, a lot of elements going on now. So we're sort of each week we're adding more and more to it. So you may have noticed, you know, that the code is just getting longer. There's a lot more functions. And um, I think it's useful to take a moment to sort of think about that process of how do you build up something that's a larger project out of these smaller modules um, in a way that both to make it so that it functions the way you want to, but also so that conceptually it kind of makes sense and you can follow along with the logic of how this thing is structured. Um, so I thought I'd do that here um, first, just with a couple of more sort of abstracted versions. So not working with um, the, oh, where'd it go here? Uh, not going with our JavaScript example yet, or not with our, our um, project yet, so the games, but instead just sort of thinking more broadly, like how do you devise a larger scale project uh, something that's big and break it into smaller parts that's useful. Um, and so the way I, th I thought about this, because, um, well, uh, because I have a, um, an older son who used to be interested in space and now a, a th three-year-old who is very interested in, in the Apollo space missions at the moment. Um, uh, so that's what I spent my morning doing. We're going to the moon. So how, would you, how are you going like, to go to the moon? <laughs> How are we going to make, you know, like, this is obviously not, we're not going to actually make this happen in code, but thinking through a project like that, you know, like that is a huge endeavor, right? How do you, how do you get to the moon? Um, so I wanted to think through this in two different ways, actually, because it sort of shows us something a little bit about different, um, uh, different ways of coding, I think. And Miles, you feel free to jump in as I blunder through some of this and you maybe have some better examples. Um, <laughs> but so I think what we, so initially, you know, we want to have, um, we have in our, our built-in set up this idea of an init function. So something that happens initially. Um, so we just, we're going to have built in a function that's called init. And inside of that, we're going to do stuff that's going to be related to like the setup. Okay. So in here we might have, um, uh, hey, we might have like, we might want to build spaceship. Right, and I'm going to do that as a function and say that, yeah, okay, there's this, this thing that says build spaceship. Um, and that's going to end up referencing something outside of the init function that's going to be something that's going to happen all that's going to happen down here. So it's going to be like, uh, so we define that later. We said define, we say function build spaceship. Um, and then we have all this stuff that go on inside of that. And I'm not going to go super sort of uh, super detailed in here because this is you know sort of an abstraction, but you know you you'd end up having um, all of this. Oh, that's why that's happening. Um, that all needs to be in my script tags. There we go. Now it's getting color coded. Um, so inside of here we'd have all the stuff of like, well, we need to like hire people. We need to design the spaceship. Um, we need to um, get materials. We need to uh, we need to build the thing. We need to test the thing. 
et cetera. You know, so there's all these parts that, that you, know, you can break down into further and further parts. And each of these you know, might have many, many subsets of things itself. So you might, you know, like in your code, when you're actually making a game, you know, this one isn't a very far of a stretch, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to create a, an object that's like my spaceship that's going to float around in, a, in this game environment. Um, and so in your init function, you, want to, you might want to set that up. Um, and you um, think about what all needs to go into there. You might not need to hire people, but you need to get the assets, right? You need to get in your images that are related to it. Maybe it has animations, maybe it has sounds associated with it. Who knows all the good stuff. Um, you need to be able to build it. So like, where is it going to be? Place it, all that kind of things that we've done when we've had like, all, like making our heroes or making our targets, it's that kind of idea, right? So um, what else should, would be there in the init in function um, when you're going to the moon? Um, Hire yeah. astronauts or train astronauts. Okay, yeah, we need to like train astronauts. Nice. Um, what else might we have? We might have um, calculate distance. <laughs> might want to know how far it is um, and probably there's other, some other things you need to calculate etc um, or it could be like plan mission maybe would be one yeah nice plan mission all that sort of behind the scenes stuff is going to be going on there and then eventually you know there might you know there'll be more than that there's other things that go into this etc cetera, etc cetera. and then at some point once our initialization stage is happening then you'd have something that is like our uh, launch mission. Um, and what we might also want to bring in here is this idea that there's going to be in most, um, most code that you're doing, there's stuff that happens once. And then if you're doing anything that's going to be interactive, there's the other stuff that's going to happen again over and over again. Um, so again, that's just sort of separating out into what we have as our init and I'm going to keep it here, just the same game loop function, just so it's sort of familiar. Um, so we have something that is inside of our init that would be set up that, that um, starts our game loop, and that we do that with a ticker. Um, I'm not going to put it in because this is what I'm call this is all what I call pseudocode, um, but I'm going to say like start game loop as a part of this. Okay, so then when we're down in the game loop we have all these different things that go on, um, like what's going to be happening regularly um, as, you're, as the mission is going on. You might have some things that are going to happen all the time, and you might have other things that happen just at certain times in your process or in your game. So for example, um, you might say like, check fuel status. Um, and that's going to be something that maybe is going to be all the time. You're going to need to be monitoring um, like every, every second you're checking and saying like, okay, what are, how are conditions? Um, check the fuel status, um, check, uh, oxygen levels, you know, all these sort of key things, um, that then eventually are going to be broken out. You know, there'd be, there'd be their own functions that are going to be like, go look at this particular piece of equipment, read the value, check if that value is, is what we expect it to be update our status, all that kind of good stuff. Um, so those are things, and I'm sure there's a lot more that would be happening over and over again. You'd want to happen the whole time. But then there might be, there might be functions that you're going to want to happen just at certain times. And one way to do this is that you could build them all into your game loop, and then you just sort of turn them on or off, at, uh, depending on where you are in your mission. So for example, um, we could say, uh, we might have an initial uh, launch, uh, launch from Earth as a function. We have um, orbit Earth as a function. I'm not going to go too detailed in here. We have um, get to moon as a function. We have um, land on moon as a function we have return to Earth. I'm simplifying here for those of you that are aficionados of, of the Apollo missions. But so let's say 
all of these things. Now, it, it, at first you might think, well, that seems sort of strange to have this in the game loop, right? Because every frame, so to speak, it might be odd to be thinking like every frame are you launching from Earth? Every frame are you orbiting Earth? Mm, probably not. Um, but, um, but this is one way that you can approach code, which is that you have each of these things and then inside of it we have a Boolean, basically, or some way of your checking and saying like, are we still in this state? What is the current state? Um, so um, I'll put that up here as one more thing. Check uh, mission status. Okay, and we're not going to go too much longer on this, so don't worry. Um, but um, you might say in you so you have a function that might be something like. Um, check mission status. And in that, we might have a series of conditions where you'd say like, if um, launch from Earth is completed, then Uh, what do we call it? We say status is now going to get orbit Earth. And so what that means is it's basically putting us into a series of different states. And this is like a very minimal version of what we might call a state engine. So you have something where initially, our initial condition might be that um, we are going to launch from Earth. And then so we had run this launch from Earth function. And then if launch from, from Earth within that function, once it does whatever it needs to do, it will say completed. So, okay, we launch from Earth, that section gets completed. If launch from Earth is completed, then we go in and say, okay, the next status is going to be orbit Earth. So then we would do this function. And so each time we're going through the game loop, now we're basically disregarding the launch from Earth. And now we're thinking about um, what does it take to orbit Earth? And then when that one gets completed, we turn on the status for get to moon, et cetera. So you get these things that then look like on the surface, they look like things that are happening all the time, but then you can start doing things more sequentially. And that's something that we might not even get to this week uh, so much, um, although the, the, I think there's some little elements that will point in that direction. But as you're moving towards thinking about expanding projects and making it like that you have an opening sequence, you have a level one, you have a level one completed sequence, and you have a level two, things like that, you start getting into situations where you have more and more stuff to manage. But really, if you return to this simple idea of having all the things encapsulated within functions, I think it really helps to clarify what's going on. So here, again, I just have this game loop that's gonna happen over and over again. And within that, it, it goes out gets information from each of these different functions um, as needed. Um, so, you know, then if we wanted to go back and now let's, let's actually go look for a second um, at our project one three. Um, so the stuff that we were working on for this last week and just, again, just a very brief overview and we'll sort of look at that, how that plays out um, here in this sort of idea. Um, I think you probably can't see that, so I'll have to share a different screen. Um, okay, so now we can see this. And David, I actually have an overview of this slide if you want. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah, so like if you, you, if you give me, let me share, and you can talk over this too if you want, okay. if this helps. I, I don't know if this would be, we could do this first, but. Mm -hmm. Um. Uh. Yeah. So uh, let's see if I can share here. Oh, yeah. You have to. You have to let me share because they changed that default. Yep. I'm working on it oh. here. Okay. Sweet. Um. Yeah. So here's the. Oh, where'd it go? That's not it. This one here. Um. And if you want, or maybe I can just talk about this for a second and then go, we can go back into the specifics of the code. So there are basically 
if you think about it, there are three kind of main things that are happening and they're happening like David's ex describing in a very specific sequence. So essentially what you're doing like is that we're, we're basically lighting like a chain of firecrackers. So like there's one fuse and that one fuse goes and it lights off all this other stuff, makes all this stuff happens happen. And so that one lighting the fuse is the HTML basically is that the HTML um, is, is setting up our, um, like we said, going back to this, um, the HTML contains all of the scripts and everything that we're going to be running. So everything, nothing can happen without that HTML because the HTML is what we actually load from, uh, that's what your viewer, the player is going to type in a URL and what facilitates that URL meaning something and loading something is the HTML. And that's really what it's there for. And specific, specifically, the HTML is setting up, sets up the web page. And as part of loading the web page, it, it sets up the canvas, which is the space. And then it calls init for us. And init is in our JavaScript function. And so like David was saying, there are some things that happen only once or specifically or kind of manually. And there are things that happen in perpetuity. So, um, you know, there are things that we just always want to have going on and there are things that we are doing very specifically. And so init is one of those things that happens specifically. It happens only one time and it's called by the loading of the web page. The, the web page is the trigger. And what init does is it, is it does two things, three things really. Uh, I left that off there. It sets up the stage, which is based on the canvas and it sets up the ticker. And the ticker, the stage is our space where things will happen. And the ticker is this thing that's continuously revolving. And so that, that continuous revolution or whatever cycle is, is what's going to call a lot of our other functions. But there's another step to get to, and that's the next step. So init uh, sets up the stage and the ticker. And uh, let's say we could say that the uh, ticker uh, well, let's just say calls init game. So as, as the last thing that init does is it calls our init game function. And so all that's in here. Um, let's see. Um, so, so yeah, HTML. And so our global variable section, we didn't talk about that, but that's part of our script that's there. But here's init, and so it calls init, and then init calls init game. Init in the ticker is also calling the game loop. It also tells the ticker to call the game loop. We'll take a look at that in just a second. So, and those are all functions. These are all functions. So everything that we're talking about is calling these function definitions that we've set up here. So like we said last week, you shouldn't have any code that's just hanging out outside of a function definition. So that's one of the first things you wanna check is to make sure that everything is within a function definition. Um, so then once that's set up, um, init game, what does it do? Init game is gonna set up all of our gameplay objects. It's gonna make, make stuff. It's gonna make the things that we need to play the game. So if we were playing chess, it would make the chess board and make all the pieces and put them on the right squares so we could start playing chess. So if we were playing Space Invaders, it would make 30 Space Invaders and it would make three barriers and it would make a player missile cannon and set it up in a certain place. If we were playing, um, you know, Minecraft, it would be like set up a world made out of blocks uh, and place the player within that world made out of blocks in a certain biome or something like that. Um, so that's what init game does. It just does that setup, but that's it. It's a, that's one of those things like hit a button one time and it happens and that's it. There's no perpetuity to it. But the game loop is that thing that, that happens constantly. So, you know, like when you drive a car, you get into the car and you turn on the ignition, but you don't keep turning on the ignition as you're driving. You know, you're not going like, I gotta make this car go, like ignite, 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 ignite. No, there's one ignition, boom, and then the engine starts and the engine goes and you don't have to keep doing that. You know, that would actually mess up your ignition system. So the ignition system just happens once and then the car engine goes. That's, that's the analogy of the engine. Is the engine kind of 
you're not sitting there moving the pistons back and forth yourself in the car. That's happening automatically for you. And that's the game loop. So the game loop is calling all the things that need to happen constantly in order for us to have the experience of playing a game. And it's going to call primarily handle keys, which is going to listen for key presses. And if a key is pressed, it's going to call additional functions. And so like we've been saying with coding and all this stuff is kind of like, it's like these, the Russian nesting doll idea, you know, so if we look at that kind of process that we just talked about, the HTML loads, it calls init, init calls, sets up the ticker, and so it calls game loop. So game loop is called by the ticker, which is set up in init. And then game loop is calling handle keys. And so if a key is pressed, it might, call our fire fun fire flower function. So we're going to shoot some flowers at the bees. <laughs> and uh, so it would call this, call this function down here. And so everything's nested. It's like, you've got this kind of hierarchy and that's what we're trying to get to today is to get to the point where you're really thinking about that hierarchy and where things go logically, which is kind of the challenge of this, because as, as David was saying, it's like we get more and more and more and more detail. So we're going to get more and more and more and more functions that are farther and farther and farther down this chain, but you have to keep this chain in mind. Like this is conceptually our big task this week is to really start to absorb this. And so, you know, that this changes if we look at, um, you know, game loop um, is something that's set up by a knit. The other thing that was set up by a knit was, um, whoops, uh, turn these off here. Uh, is init game. So HTML calls init, init calls init game. And init game is our setup function. And, it, and the setup would call, let's say, a function called make targets, like with our for loop that says for i equals zero, i less than 25, or number of targets, do make targets. And then that would call like a make target function. So we've got all of these like little subsets of functions that are happening. And kind of conceptually keeping them straight is kind of our challenge this coming uh, week. I think that's it. <laughs> cool. Yeah. Great. Um, I li love the nesting dolls. Yeah, it's weird. I mean, how, like, it took me a long time to understand that, that all these functions are actually, it's about where they're called in the order you got to, and it's hard to keep all that stuff straight. Like you were saying, there's so many different things happening. We're like, what? <laughs> like, you know, so the, 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 the test is kind of like, you know, if I need to move something, where does that happen? That'd be the simplest way to think about it. It's like, where would a move function take place? Um, and if you think about the car ignition thing, that would be like move, 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 move with the key. No, it's like you want the engine to handle that. So it's just moving. Your car is just moving automatically. That kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks. Um, great. Well, I guess let's um, uh, look over now towards project 1.4, which is what we're going to be working towards. Um, and so that's um, up on the Moodle page now. So you're welcome to uh, check it out under week seven. Um, and we'll upload the video to this there later today so you can um, re re revisit it. Um, but yeah, let's get started with that. And I think really what I want to look at is going to be that big picture overview um, as a starting point from here. And um, this is another, you know, I think in these last few weeks, there isn't so much so in a sense like we're giving you a fair amount in these tutorial codes you're giving you a lot of stuff um, that's already functioning and so really one of the there's a couple different routes that you can approach this one is that you um, people can either work with um, just getting the code that we give you and make sure it's working and try and get your own images in there um, or um, i've had a few students that are taking sort of week by week they're sort of building up their own um, project version, which is of their own their own game that may ac actually have some different behaviors than what we're creating here. Um, and each week, 
when there's sort of new material that comes in, you take out the portions you need and you come over and you put it into the into that game that you're developing. So you have, um, it's like, okay, well, I got images working and now I'm gonna get um, from the new tutorial, I'm gonna take over and figure out how to get the character to move and I'll place that in here and make that working. And then I'm gonna work on, uh, on boundary checking and get that to work over here, et cetera. And all these different elements go back and forth from this sort of tutorial. And then you add it into your own, um, your own version. So that's a great way if you're feeling, um, if you're, especially if you're feeling somewhat comfortable with the materials as we've been working through it, um, to be able to feel free to like copy and paste from the tutorial over into this new version that's, that's really just your game. Um, so that's, that's, a great approach if you're able to. If not, feel free to just stick looking at the tutorials, really sort of under trying to understand what's happening um, and work through with the materials that are present. Um, but really, we're now in week seven, and so we're working towards week eight, nine, ten. So over the next three weeks, so by the end, uh, by week ten, uh, which is really kind of like two weeks plus a little debugging, um, that you'll have your own version using your own images. Um, and whatever type of interactivity you want to have happening um, uh, working so that we can showcase those at the end of the term. Um, so let's look here. This is a week, this is the 1-4 project tutorial. Um, and the, the things we want to really hone in on, I think first are really just these, uh, um, so there's a, a few things that have been added into the init game um, just to make things a little more uh, clean in a way, really. So some things like this you might notice. Um, we have, instead of actually having the code uh, in the init game function itself for making a background, that has now been encapsulated into its own function. So that as init game gets more complex, um, it's nice to start offloading things into subsequent, um, into uh, other functions so that it keeps this clean and, and legible. So we can just quickly at a glance, okay, what's happening when I initialize the game? Okay, we're, we're saying we're in the init game. We're setting up some initial values of things. We're gonna set the score back to zero. So let's say we had a, the idea of a game that we, we load it up, we can play it, but then either you win or you lose. And then at some point it's gonna restart and you don't wanna have to restart and reload everything. You just want to put it back in that initial state of, okay, score is back down to zero. So that's what's happening here. Set a game clock to zero. Um, is the game over? We're setting that to false. No, the game is not over. We're going to start over again. And um, so that's like this idea of, of a state engine. We're saying, is the game over or the game not over? And then be able to do different things based on that. Um, empty out the targets array. Some other things here setting the hero's position and the, the background to nothing. And then making, so make background, we pass in an image that we want to be the background. Then all the familiar stuff that we're used to, if we scroll down and found this make background function is now down in here. It creates and goes, gets a bitmap, adds it to the stage. With other things, there might be positioning or other styling stuff you need to do in there. This one though, just simple like that. You do our make targets, which was, a bulk of what really was happening last week. Um, so we populated an array with targets that each have all the properties you want. You got uh, same thing of make a hero, which is gonna be very much like the background. And then a new one here, make score text. Um, and so let's look at that in a second. And then the last one here is collision, collision gnome set debug true. And that's just, that's something that we're starting to get into dealing with collisions and we're accessing this library called Collision Gnome. Um, and this is a, a function within that, a method within that, that gives you debugging information. So it's, it shows you like what actually is colliding so you can see how that's working. We'll get that up here so you can see in a second. But first, uh, this make score text, let's see where that is. Let's go make score text. And this has something that's new that we haven't really um, dealt with previously, but it's a pretty simple idea which is, uh, oh, that's update score text. Where is the uh, make score text here? Um, and do you want to show me that? Yeah. We, have a, we have a quick special surprise here to re recap. Remember we had our moon launch going on earlier? We have a, a special guest here. They wanted to bring in, do you want to show it, Casper? This is my, my three-year-old son, Casper. Can you scoot over to <laughs> me? 
Here's a. Oh. <laughs> he's bringing in our uh, our uh, moon launch. Moon launch. Yeah. So cool. He tapes up yeah. the. <laughs> And, and we put foot 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 that that what was supposed to be in the and, and we tape this up there. Okay, yeah, we got it all set up. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> Can't wait to see it launch. Yeah. Oh, oh, here we got it. We got to do this one. Okay, I'll go ahead and press the button, Casper. Can you press the button on here. Ten, nine, eight, ignition sequence start. <laughs> oh, you can't tell. It's vibrating. <laughs> oh, that's so cool. Yeah. Oh, wait, let's see. The first stage has to remove. Get the stages off here. First stage comes off. <laughs> Second stage. I won't take it all apart. And then the third parts would come off here, but he's he's specially taped that, so we'll leave that on there. So exactly, it's like breaking up a function or breaking up a coding into a series of, of steps and stages, and we'll get bring you to the moon. Thanks for showing it, Casper. Yay, Casper! Cool. Well, say thanks, thanks, Casper. <laughs> okay, thank you for showing what you did. Good job. <laughs> That's good. That was relevant. You could still see him. Yeah. Good. Yeah. <laughs> that nice. was relevant. <laughs> I was thinking that kind of reminds me that, that you guys might not know this about David, but last year he won, they won the uh, Mount Ashland. Uh, the What was that called again? Oh, geez. The, <laughs> the dummy downhill. The dummy downhill where he constructed a whole Ghostbusters uh, ski rig with a huge car, the Ghostbusters car, and the giant ghost on top, and that it, it ran independently. And uh, yeah, it was funny, because it was your older, it was uh, Lyndon, right? He was like, yeah. we're gonna win this, right? <laughs> 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 we're gonna win. And they won, so that was good. <laughs> <laughs> it all worked out, yeah, it's like, the, le the, the lesson for the, as the parent, it's like, it's not about winning. Skills. We're you know, like we're just having fun, just having fun, and then like you win, and then it undermines all that all that lesson learning. Yeah, you're like, oh. So it's like, now how are we gonna win next year? No. Yeah, right. No. Yeah. We avoided that one by by dumbing down, so being canceled this year due to a uh, uh, coronavirus. Good job. <laughs> so we work. have some we Good have some um, uncompleted uh, snowmen in our garage that were because it was like three days away from happening. So you got anyway. a whole start for next year. Then. Yeah. yeah. Momentum. Nice. <laughs> well, thanks for, uh, thanks for uh, hang hanging in there with our, through our uh, three-year-old demo. Um, that was relevant. That was relevant. Was, that was, it that's, was. that's, it, it, it's learning. Up the whole moon launch thing. So yeah, that's I, I wasn't right joking. There. That was my, that's our morning now. <laughs> <laughs> um, moon launch. Yep. Okay. Well, that was good because the launch happens once. Like you press the button deliberately, and that's a yeah. function you call one time. Yeah, mm -hmm. you're not continually. Well, of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I was in here trying to find. I think our. Uh, um, let's see here. I was trying to find our text. So there was a score text. Make score text. Where is that? There it is, make score text. I just scroll right by it. <clears throat> so this was a new thing that we haven't seen before. Um, it's a really easy concept though. So hopefully it will, it's just an e a simple extension from, um, from what we were doing. So here is the idea of you want to be able to display text. And here we want to display the score to be able to say like, what's the score at any one point? So if you have objects that collide, um, you can either think of that as being a positive thing. And so, so you collect something and it, your score goes up, or it might be a negative thing, like you hit a bomb and your score goes down. Um, either way, that kind of thing can happen here. So this function makes score text. Um, uh, here is the really the core functionality that we haven't um, seen before. Um, it's a simple line in create.js. Instead of a create.js bitmap, it's create.js.text. And then you have to pass it some info um, of what you want to display. So here is, this is, you know, adding two things together. So this is just a string back to when we were doing code pen stuff. 
a string and then we're adding um, the score value to it. So we have a score plus um, an actual score. I don't know. Do you know Miles? Do you know books about yourself? <laughs> um, books about Miles. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a book about Miles. Miles, is it a mouse? Yeah. yeah. Um, it's a library book. Um, I think, oh. I think. It might have gotten in the gym. No, there was a book about mice that, uh, that's, I think it's in there. It's upside down in the shelf there oh, okay. um, with my, like mice sharing stuff. <laughs> okay. I'm gonna go Miles I think that might be. <laughs> Sorry, we're getting some interruptions today. My apologies. Um, uh, so the, these are good though. This is quality. This is, uh, yeah, this is, this is most of the rest of our, of our day, <laughs> which is good. It's great. But, um, yeah, remembering which book, which book has a, has a, a mouse named miles in it. And yeah, I think I might've got it, but I don't remember if it's, that's it. So yeah, so something like this, you know, it's going to display the word score. And then it's going to write a number because the score is a variable that we're updating the score value to. So it initially will be zero, zero. When you score, get an increased score, it's going to get incremented. And as long as we, we keep calling this make score text more than once or we update it in some way, um, which is probably more likely what we're going to do, um, then we'll be able to keep updating that value. Uh, so let's take a look at that and see. So we have in this one, we had in our init game function, we have a make score text. And that takes care of, so that's run once. So what that does, what we just looked at here, it creates the score text as this stuff and it positions it. So it has an X and Y property um, as a baseline text, which is um, basically like, is this gonna be, um, I'm not actually sure what that does actually, whether it's just doing numbers or doing alphabet, alphabetic. Um, so it's in there. I, I don't know if you have to use that line. Um, Nate, do you know Miles on that? Yeah, it's kind of, uh, it's not essential. I think it's one of those things, it's just kind of a um, styling uh -huh. thing. Okay. Yeah, I think I just put it in there because like it, it's there. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But I think it'll run without it. Yeah, it's like some of those things at the very top of like the HTML when you're like, describe it you say like yeah. html like you're going to use unicode format for the texting text encoding and stuff like that it's you know it will run without it um there might be some certain situations in which it might cause a funky thing if it's not there but anyway um so the key thing that's one of those things that i think you're learning code yeah oh go ahead yeah no i'll finish your sentence so as you're learning code you oh, know, i was say that oh i was just gonna say that Oh, we're having some freezing and asynchronous okay. moments here, yeah. but that's all right. <laughs> so anyway, when you're sometimes when you're learning code, I think Miles is going to say there's some things when it's harder to know what is essential versus what things aren't, um, and some things you can get rid of and not and work just fine, and some things um, actually do have to be there. So, and that's that is a challenge. Um, here, when the in the score text part, the thing that I didn't mention is that there's some stuff after the commas here. So this is what's going to get displayed, and then a comma, and what comes after the comma is going to be what well, you can guess, right? That's going to be a font. So it gives you the font size in pixels, and then it gives you the type or the, the typeface that you're going to be using. So what font is being used? And then um, the next thing is going to be a color. And you can just, you can determine the color in a number of different ways. There's some hard coded like words that the web knows as certain types of colors. So basic things like black, red, green, um, et cetera. Some known web safe colors. Um, or you can enter them in as a hex code. So that's what this hex code is. And hex code, if you haven't encountered them before, it's a six digit code. Um, the first two digits have to do with um, the red value. Second value, second two are green and Third two are um, blue values. So, um, but they're on this hexadecimal scale. So it's more than zero to nine, it goes zero to nine, but then it also has all a bunch of letters 
um, that are options as well. Um, so this is has more red and green than it does have blue for this color. Um, so that gives us color. Um, and then so all that happens just once, but if we want to then update, so like we something happens and then we update the score, that's going to happen somewhere else. And if we see, that's going to be happening in this um, draw, oh, okay, draw new frame uh, function here, which normally we've been calling game loop um, function. So same, same thing. This is the thing that's going to be happening 60 times a second. So maybe while I'll, I didn't catch that earlier, maybe we can update that so it's um, familiar. But it works exactly the same. So in here, we see there's one that's called update score text. And then if we just look at that down here, um, that's something that's going to be happening every frame. It's going to be updating our score text. And inside of here, it's saying, if not game over, whoa, OK, remember that back from our Boolean days. So that means if the game over variable is not true, then so that means we're still playing the game. Game is not over. Um, then we do this, which is going to be replacing the text that's associated with our text thing that we just drew or we just wrote. It has a property called text, and it's going to overwrite it with whatever the current score is. So this allows that to be updated. And then in the other case, so that if game over is true, then we then we enter into this part. And then it replaces the whole text with you win. Okay, so let's, before we bore ourselves too much, um, let's jump over now to actually looking at this, just seeing what this does so we can sort of, um, we see that in action. Um, so you're welcome to, uh, to get this, um, the download the one four from the Moodle page and then upload it or just open it into your Google Chrome. Um, and it should work in the way that, that we're demoing here. Let me get mine going. Um, place it over here. Okay, and I have to sh change my screen share, so I'll hop out and back in. I'll just do the desktop. Okay, can you see this game going on here? Did I share the right part? Is this happening? Yeah, we're getting a lot of we're getting a lot of breakup uh, on the audio, so it's kind of the, the, I think the connection's spotty on your end. Uh, okay, sorry. Make sure I don't. Yeah, I don't think I have anything else that's really. But it is. It's kind of jerking around there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just quickly make sure there's nothing else that should be eating up a lot of anything. No. Okay. Well, sorry. Um, so yeah, so we see in here, if I just refresh it here, we're getting a bunch of collisions. I can move this character around. If I do, when I click, hit, hit an object, we should see that my score is going up. And then eventually, I'll be able to collect everything. Maybe. And when I do, it says you win. And then after a certain amount of time, it starts over again. Okay, so that gives us a, a few different things that, that are happening here. And maybe we should break these up into sort of one at a time. Or maybe Miles, are you, if you're getting, do you want to take over? If yeah, I'm David, do you? Better? Yeah, let me, let's try it in here uh, since I'm hardwired into this now. So let, let's, let's see if this works. So, all right, I'll, I'll try to take over from that. So. Nice. I'll, I'll share here. Um, but yeah, cool. We'll give it a shot here. All righty. Whoa, I'm close to the camera. Uh, all right. Are you guys seeing the game now? Are you guys seeing the gameplay? Okay. Yep. So does it look pretty smooth or it looks a little better? It might be better. Okay, cool. So oh, this is the game before the collision. So things are moving around and they're bouncing around. And if we go back to our code here, in order to get the collisions to happen, just like David was showing us, we go to our um, game loop, right? I guess we called it drawing a frame. 
Uh, that's the wrong code. Ha ha. Where did it go? There it is. Okay. Okay. So now, um, also Justin had pointed out, there's a good catch there. There's a, there's a bug in this code and I, I can't remember if we did this intentionally or not. We'll say, yeah, I was intentional as part of the, it's a learning experience. Uh, not a fatal bug and it works just fine if you happen to be working with a square canvas, <laughs> but if you don't, it would cause some troubles. And that's, um, on the make targets function, uh, just really quickly, um, there's the call here to, so we're setting up the exposition on targets array right here. And I'll turn this on. So right here, and it's called stage width. It refers to stage width. And target array Y is also referring to stage width and that should be stage height. So that's the, that's the. Oh yeah. Yep. There. Yeah, so it's a small, small thing, but good catch there. And um, yeah, I think that's the only place that that's happening. Um, so to get collision to work and then using collision gnome, and remember collision gnome is sourced up here. Because we sourced it up here, we can now call it, uh, call the, the methods and properties within there. So uh, we go to our init game function and we've got our collision gnome is set to true. And why is it not showing up here? Because that's set to true. Oh, because I was probably calling the wrong code. That's why. Ha ha. Copy file path. I get it. I'm on top of it here. Okay. So there we go. So now we have, um, as the targets hit the hero, they kind of funny they leave their collision boxes behind and you can see the collision boxes are actually not corresponding all that well to the size of the uh, targets yet so that's something we'll work on but um, it's working so if I move the character around and he starts running it or start running into these targets and then they're finally liberated from their collision box but you can kind of see how that that works and this is just for the debugging for us to see like sure enough, if, if uh, that the collision detection is working the way that we want it to. And this is also showing us what determines a collision. So a collision is not what we would call pixel perfect. So it's not tracing the outline of this character, which is not a square or the targets, which are not squares but it's using a square as a simple kind of dummy object that's simpler than the complex shape and outline of our targets in the hero. So it's using that collision box. And that collision box is something that we can change the size of uh, to, um, to suit our purposes. And we'll, we'll kind of get a tighter fit for that as we go, but this is just, early days showing us how that works. And a lot of this coding is going to be about refinement. You know, it's like you get it to work once we're like, Hey, this is great. Like this is, you know, we've got collision working and we've got a score that's going up as well. So as, as the score, as we hit more targets, our score goes up, which is what we were just talking about. All right, David, did you have some other stuff to say about this or talk about with this? Um, uh, we're we'll going anywhere. So yeah, just reviewing, you know, we had that collision detection is happening. Um, this is important that, and then just jump in if the, there was something here, but in our, um, draw a new frame, which unfortunately, I don't know I, I changed my mind here, I guess, but game loop, you know, so we use the same thing, game loop or draw a new frame, same thing, different names. Uh, this is the function that's being called. This is our engine. So it's going zzz. So what we're doing is we're, we're calling the function here, which is check collisions. And check collisions, it's, is there, is there a collision? Is there a collision? Is there a collision? Is there a collision? It's like our handle keys. It's like, is someone pressing a key? Are they pressing a key? Are they pressing a key? Are they pressing a key? So it's this kind of continual kind of neurotic, like return to the same question over and over and over again. So check collisions is saying, it's what it's doing, what's it doing? Um, let's see, if we go to the check collisions function, 
It says, if the game is not over, uh, do this. Okay, so if the game is not over, then let's check for collisions. And what does it mean to check for collisions? Well, we have a for loop and a for loop is usually paired with an array. And so sure enough, it says set up a variable i that gets the length of our targets array minus one. So the length of the array, as we remember, is the total number of things in the array. Because computers count zero, the last index of the thing in the array is always gonna be one less than the total number of things in the array. So however many number of targets there are out there, start with that number, minus one. So if there are 10 targets, start with nine. So I will be nine. And then is nine greater than or equal to zero? Yeah, it is. So run the code. And once we're done running the code, subtract one from I. So, and then I will be eight. Is eight greater than or equal to zero? Yeah, it is. And so it's gonna count down through the array. Counts down through the target array. And so if, and here's this conditional, it says if the hero dot collides with, and so dot collides with is a method of the hero, but actually it's a method that's defined in uh, collision gnome, I believe, um, right? I think that's actually, yeah. So it's because collision gnome is set up, uh, we've referenced collision gnome, we have access to the collides with um, method. And so all we have to do is put in our, our, our argument, which answers the parameter is always gonna be uh, collides with what? So if the hero collides with something in the parentheses, then do something. And so what is in the parentheses is the particular thing in the target array that we're checking. So if, if we had 10 targets, the last target in the array is gonna be at index nine. And so it's gonna say, if the hero collides with the thing in the targets array at index nine, which is the last target, then what happens? Oh, score plus plus. So yay, plus one to the score variable. Um, also, ooh, this is getting exciting. Take the target off the stage. So it's done, it's over. It's like remove it so we can't see it anymore. Um, now the weird thing about working with, with uh, graphics and visuals is that the display of the target is just one aspect of the target's existence. <laughs> so as an artist, I'm used to saying like, you know, if I erase something, it's gone, right? <laughs> it's like if, if I'm making a painting and the painting had like a dog and I wipe out the dog, the dog's no longer there. But in a computer game, if I take the dog off the stage, it still exists in memory. It's still a, a functioning object. It just doesn't have a visual representation. It's still in the array, so to speak. So the next step is the key to kind of finishing that elimination when you're trying to get rid of something. And so that's to splice it out of the array. And splice is a method of our arrays, of the JavaScript array. And so splice means take it out. And the parameters it's looking for is which index do you want to take out? or start from taking things out? And then how many things do you wanna take out? So what I'm saying is go to the targets array, find the ninth thing, find the thing at index nine, and then eliminate one thing from that spot. And that's what splice does. So the, to destroy something, so to speak, like if you hit something and you want it gone, you have to do two things. You have to take it off the stage, and then you have to, uh, which is the remove child method. We had add child to add something to the stage, remove child takes it, it off the stage, and splice means take it out of the array. So we have to do those two things if we want to destroy something. And that's the end of our if statement, and then that's, that's the end of our for loop check, and so it would go to the next, and so it counts down. And the reason we're counting down when we're potentially splicing stuff out of the array is it doesn't screw us up. Because if we go check the last thing in the array, okay, index nine, boom, it's gone. All right, check the next thing in the array is index eight. Check the next thing, seven. So even if we're getting rid of those things as we go, we're not screwing up our count. 
But if we were to count up the array, we'd be screwing up the count because we go, go to index zero, which is the first thing in the array, get rid of it. Well, what happens when you get rid of that first thing in the array? The whole array chunks down so that now the thing that was at index one is now at index zero. And so then it, you're going, okay, go to index one. Well, you skipped over the thing that should have been at index one. And so you get all kinds of problems, all kinds of bugs and screwy stuff that happens. So generally, if you're counting down in an array, if you're, if you're, going, if you're going to walk through an array and you're potentially taking stuff out of it, you start at the last index and work your way down. All right, so do we have some, my chat window got covered here. Okay, cool. Yeah, I might um, just, I don't know if you can hear me. Yes. Um, I, I'll just address that. There was just Wait. sort of an extension here and sorry if I'm breaking up. Um, Sean yeah, was good. asking about um, just sort of where, like where the actual collision checking is happening. Um, and a lot of that is happening in the library. Um, so there's that JavaScript library um, uh, collision. Um, I'll open it up. Yep. Um, and we'll take a look at it in a second. Um, and really what we're doing in, in the code that we just showed you is we're assigning things to be using that library. So when you create a target, you can assign it to be um, a part of the collision gnome uh, like process. Um, and then collision gnome in itself is going to be doing all the, all sort of the deep details of actually checking things. Yeah, and if, if I could diagram it out, um, can you guys uh, see, are we in Photoshop, basically? Yep. You guys see this? So, yeah, like if we, what Collision Gnome is basically doing um, is this. It's, oops, let me put this on there. Um, so it's this, it's like if we've got an image, um it's in that box right so you guys and so collision gnome is assigning one of these collision boxes to each thing and so this collision box well what is this box if you think about this mathematically like what is this so it's like we said registration point so we've got a registration point uh which is um in the center of the box that's what's being used to actually like um position this on the stage. So when we move this around, it's, it's using that center point to determine where this is. So we have a set of coordinates. So this based on that point. So how do we find what these boundaries are? Well, we would take the current X and Y position. So let's say this is at, um, something like this. So if we go, okay, so we've got a, a grid here. And so when this is here, that means it's at that coordinate, right? So that's what it means to be at this yellow coordinate. So that yellow coordinate would be, let's just make up a coordinate would be, you know, um, let's say 100, 100, even though that's not right, but just to make it easy. So this is currently at coordinate, um, 100 X and 100 Y. So that's where that blue point is, is at 100, 100. And so this has a property of width, right? So this box then has, has the properties associated with it, which would be, um, oh, let's say, um, you know, box width uh, is 50. I know this is totally wrong as far as the scale of this, but whatever. Okay. Let's change that. All right. So box width is 50. All right. So that means that the half width, the distance from this blue point to this line here, would be 25, right? So if this whole thing is 50, uh, I don't have my tablet hooked up, so forgive me for the mouse drawing here, but this is 50. Uh, 
the total width of the box is 50. It would also have a half width. And we're going to see this quite a bit. And I think we're already seeing this, if I remember right, in our collision code, you know, for the boundary checking, we might be doing this already. So this also has um, uh, a height or a half width. So let's say half width equals 25. So now we would say, well, th that means that this point, if the box is at 100, 100, the farthest point on the right side of the box is going to be, uh, so we'll have one more here. Uh, let's call it maximum X. <laughs> or let's say uh, box boundary right is going to be 125. So that means that this coordinate here is going to be 125 over. So if I draw another line here, make it blue, I guess. So that blue line is going to be at 125. So I don't know if this might take, if we go back to collision gnome here and take a look at that, um, that that's what it's setting up is this box is the actually add collider here. And um, the, the checks for collisions is actually in this right here. Actually, I didn't look at this before this, but I'm trying to remember if. Yeah, so it's checking this X distance, Y distance, or, or kind of like it's checking that, do these things. So like we would know if, if we're checking that this thing collides with something. So let's make another box over here. So if we wanted to see if, whoops, you daisy. If we wanted to see if these are, try this one more time. There we go. So if we have two boxes and we want to see if these boxes collide or not, um, let's turn this off for a second. All right. So if I want to see if if these <laughs> stop, <laughs> if this this box collides. The first thing we would check is like, there's no way this box would be colliding. We'd have, if it's left boundary, kind of we have, if this that would also have a left boundary, is it has to be within the range of, of, of these measurements. So like, for example, so this is, let's bring those back. Yeah. Uh, so this was 125, I guess I undid my little, Five. So the left boundary of this has to be between 125 and what? Oops. <laughs> there you go. And what? And anyone want to guess what this would be? It would be 100 minus the half width, so it's going to be 75. So you can kind of see where we're going with this, that this, this edge would need to be somewhere between here and here, between the, that range, in order for the, the check to, to have to proceed. If, if it's out here, there's no reason to check it. You know what I mean? And then we'd also have to check if we'd have the same thing set up for, for height that we do for width. And so that those things would then be intersecting. So we're kind of, we have to set up the logical conditions 
by which those things could be happening. So based on the, the, the where the blue dot is, we have to then determine, okay, what, what's the extent that this could be happening? And then, yeah, whether or not it would be possible for that mathematically to be in a collision space is kind of what we're, what we're doing. I, that's, a, that's a start to it. Collision actually can get really kind of complicated. There are other ways to do it. Um, and this is like a relatively simple way to do it. Um, I don't know if that answers the question, but that's kind of a start to thinking about collision. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, and you know, I was I was actually just doing a uh, um, um, working on a different coding project, and it was using a different uh, different library. Um, this li library called Processing. Um, and they have a JavaScript version of it called uh, P5. Um, and it's interesting how different libraries are set up to do different things easily. So like CreateJS, it's actually really easy to just click on, like make a, make a square and click on the square and do something as a result. Um, the, but in processing, it's not sort of built to do that. So in order for me to make, an, I wanted to make a, an object draggable. Um, so I could click on it and then drag it somewhere um, on the screen. Um, and in order to do that, I had to do a, go through basically making a collision detection system that was very similar to what Miles just described. So you would just basically say, okay, I, let's say I have this circle, or I guess a square is even easier, and I have a square, and you have to, when I click the mouse, you check is the, is the mouse, are the mouse coordinates within the boundary of that square? And if so, um, then, then allow the, when you're dragging, allow the position of that square to be adjusted based on the mouse position. Um, so it seemed, in a way, it seems like, well, you should just be able to click on the, you know, click on the square, it's a square, and move it. Um, but it's, it's not as obvious as that, because the square is not a thing. The square is just an, an image that's placed on the canvas um, and, um, and is being drawn there. So you need to get access to, like, to know that you clicked in the same place. What's obvious to us might not be obvious to the computer. Um, so yeah, this kind of stuff creeps up all the, all the time. Um, another you know simple, um, fairly simple uh, version of collision detection, if you wanted to pursue it, would also be you know just using if you wanted a little tighter um, hit area, so to speak. Um, is it's also possible to do a similar sort of thing with circles instead of with a square. Um, and then it's really you're just checking. You have to the calculations are a little bit more complicated, but it's just a, one line of of that math calculation of how do you know the distance from a center point out to the radius of a circle all the way around, and you're making that. But otherwise, you're making a similar um, calculation. Um, and then I think there. Are, what what are some of the other ones? There's like image or there's like pixel um, pixel based collision where you're sort of actually checking the colors of of what's a transparent pixel versus what's not in a PNG and then seeing if that's colliding with something else. Um, those get more complicated and, and also get more um, CPU intensive. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, collisions, I, I was looking to see if I had another diagram of this. I was working on a, like a more complicated version uh, with intersections and vectors and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was sad because it, it was really just brutal. It was like so inefficient the way I was doing it. And I worked so hard mm -hmm. <laughs> and figured it out and it was just like, Oh, <laughs> but I, I'll, I, there's a probably a way I, I, we can diagram this out and explain it more. Cause it's actually really cool. I mean, it's, it's not crazy, insane, impossible to understand or anything. So. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Well, let's see what else is there. I mean, I guess, of course, if there are questions, please shout them out um, on chat, chat or, uh, or out loud is fine too. Um, and then otherwise, we can maybe take a look and see what are the other key things going on in the code this week. The collision detections is really a big part of it. Um, and then we have um, the scorekeeping, which I kind of talked through, but we yeah. didn't really, maybe, we, Miles, you could take a look at yeah. what happens when. When a collision happens, um, how it updates the score. Yeah, so like David was saying, um, the when we when we set up our score on the screen um, with this make score text. So that was under again 
we have the two areas where things are happening this week are init game. Init stays the same. Init game, which is our setting up our game objects, things that are going to show up in the game, and things like score. And then we also have our draw new frame or our game loop where things are running. So um, in init game, there was we we set the score variable to zero, so we real, initialize it to zero, and then we run this make score text function that David talked us through. And so the make score text function is down here. It creates a new there's that new keyword again which means a new instance of a create js.txt object um or a, uh so it runs that constructor function of the text class and it uses these uh, arguments and it creates a text object and it's just worth pointing out for what it's worth that one of the things that create js does is it it kind of shortcuts things that you could do. You don't have to use CreateJS to do what we're doing. It just, CreateJS kind of takes out some steps along the way. So you could just set up a text object directly in JavaScript and anyway, this is just a shortcut way to do it. Um, and what we did is we, so we have, a, we have a variable called score text. That's the main thing we want to take away from this is there's a variable. The variable contains a number, which is the score. At the beginning, the number is zero. So how do we change the score? Well, as we saw with our collision, the way we handle collision is that if there's a collision, score gets incremented by one. So, okay, great. So the score was zero, now it's one. But as we will find, if you kind of mess around with this, that doesn't automatically update the score text. So the display of the score variable is a separate step from incrementing the variable itself. So that's, again, getting used to the computer thing and the nesting dolls. There's always, there are always like more steps than you would think as a human to, uh, to get what the result we want. So we have to do is we've incremented the score. Well, if we go back up here to the game loop, the draw new frame function, there is, aha, another function that's going to run 60 times a second, and that's update score text. So in the collision that happens, the score has changed. It was zero, now it's one. But at this fraction of a microsecond, we would see before the next line executes, like truly like a micro millisecond or something, the score would still be zero it would still read a zero. And so in, let's see what update score text does. And again, this is a function that's called 60 times a second. So update score text is down here. And so what this function is doing is it's saying, hey, if the game is not over, take the score text dot text property. And this is the dot text property is a property of the text class, the text object that was constructed through the CreateJS library. So it has a text property. It's not a method because there are no parentheses after it. So there's no parentheses, it means it's a property. Take the property and give it this new value. So the equal sign remember means assign or give it this new value. So take the text property, which is what is actually being displayed, and give it this new value, which is score, the text string score, plus the new value of score, which is now one. Now, if it doesn't collide, it would give it the old value, which would be zero, right? So it's like, it, it's just, it's perpetually updating it. And this is kind of what's weird about the computer. It's doing it whether the score changes or not. So even if the score is still zero, it, it's getting a new command every 60th of a second to rewrite on the screen, whatever the heck is in that text variable, but, but, but it starts from scratch. It like takes off the old one and refreshes, refresh, 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 even if something's staying in place. That's kind of weird. It seems like frightfully inefficient, but it's not. <laughs> it's kind of the way that, that this actual redraw works on a computer screen. So yeah, so it's, it's actually, re, it doesn't update it until it, we give it the command to redraw. But it's very frustrating. <laughs> when you're trying to figure this out and you don't know that that's an extra step in the process. So 
there are all, all these kinds of hidden steps. And then we also have an else here. So if else means you're either going to do one thing or you're going to do the other. There's, no, there's nothing in between. So that means if the game is not over, do this. Otherwise, do this, which means implies the game is over. So uh, if the game is over, then run this, which is take the score text dot text and give it the text string you win. So any questions about that? Declarations? Yeah, I mean, in one other, you know, we don't really need to get into that, that efficiency too much, but I just wanted to throw out there if people are interested. There are some ways, and you know, especially if you do get, a, get games that are, uh, that have a lot going on and have a lot of things moving around, you, you get into a situation where you do start taxing the computer and you want to be able to sort of narrow down any little extra things uh, that are going on. And while this one would be a very minor, I mean, the amount of, of, of CPU power that it takes to update or refresh a text, it's sort of emblematic of other ways where you could find like, oh, well, maybe that actually there could be a way that you could do that a little more efficiently. Um, and here, maybe the example would be that you would only update the score, you'd only run the update score text function um, in or right after the score is plus plus. Um, there might you might run into some uh, some some issues around the end of game and stuff you'd have to clean up. But basically, you'd go into your check collisions, and if you get a collision with the target, then you're going to increment your score and then run your update score text. So it ends up then happening only every time that you actually have a collision, rather than happening 60 times a second. Good point. Yeah. So, so we could do that there instead of putting our call in the. I was wondering, I, you know, I wonder if we put it in there because it wasn't updating otherwise. It wasn't even showing up, maybe. Uh-huh. Well, anyway, there's something. You, as long as you, I don't, I, it's possible. Yeah, I mean, you might if you as long as it's, it's added to the stage, and there aren't things that are getting written over it. It should because like background, right? We're not redrawing the background. Yeah. Uh -huh. um, I, even though I think that's what's happening anyway. <laughs> I, I think that's kind of what, as I remember, I mean, from like it, like Canvas stuff, if you're it, like, it has to redraw everything all the time. Yeah. Well. Oh, yeah. So it's uh, the, the 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 clarification there, and it's a minor one. Um, is it's not. It's it is going to redraw it every frame. Yes, but it's not doing a call to get the get that. Um, the data from the variable score each frame. Um, we could try this that like if we so we take it out here, uh -huh. uh, comment it out, and then we could put it into that's a cool idea. Like the idea that oh we can only we should only update it if there's something to update. Uh, and so we could put it here under the collision check. So check collisions if there's a collision score plus plus and then run update score text here. We'll yeah. see if that works. My guess is there might be something funky at the end of the game. But. Yeah. Let's see. So now we go reload. That's working. Looks like it's working. Um, so let me double check. Inspect. Uh, sources. Uh, just make sure that I got the right. So, yep, it's work. Mm -hmm. So, the so that is more you can just play it out real quick and see if there's any bugs that happen when you. Okay, so David's game. prediction is that there might be a bug with the end game conditions. Maybe not. Maybe oh. not. Yeah, uh, so it didn't trigger it yet. Yeah. So we we could go back. The game restarted though. That's interesting. So we could go back and take a look at the, those game conditions. So, because um, where do we check if the game is over? Uh, oh, that's because it's in this, in the, in this. So again, we could probably take this if game over check. And uh, because probably we don't need to, there aren't, I don't know if there would still be, there shouldn't still be collisions. So anyway, that's one of those things we could, we, we might yeah. be able to get rid of this, which is again, kind of inefficient. 
because we should just assume that the game is not over if it's checking for collisions, mm -hmm. which is what's happening. So this is a great example of how we would rewrite the code to be more efficient. And also a fantastic example of kind of what you shouldn't do, which is if your code is working, don't just start rewriting it. <laughs> yeah. so before you do a rewrite, always make sure that you have the working version kind of saved. So this is a good place to say, oh, I'm gonna make this version 02, 03. And then you can rewrite it. You, like if you're changing a variable name or you're doing something that, that could potentially just make the whole thing come to a crashing halt or gives you the opportunity to make a really dumb mistake, like forget uh, or like accidentally delete a curly brace. It's not a dumb mistake, it happens all the time. It's not, there's nothing dumb about it, but it's like easy to make a mistake that, that makes everything not work. It's a lot nicer to just go back, okay, whoops, go back mm -hmm. to the working code and then kind of restart it that way. So before I, I was like, oh, if I'm gonna go in and kind of play around with this conditional, which is the way the game's being, that's a pretty major rewrite of the code. So I would, I would definitely want to kind of make a new version, but that definitely would work. Yeah. That, that would make more sense too. Cool. Yeah. Cause actually that I was just thinking about it, the, the check collisions, you, you think, well, if the game's over, it might, you know, just unnecessarily be checking all those collisions. But if you look in actually yeah. the check collisions, it has, it's checking collisions on all the elements of the array and as that and that array gets yeah. erased each time it's zero nothing goes away so it's iterating through zero so it's it isn't really yeah. an efficient yeah. problem there and we already have a check we also have a check game over function already so that's a redundant check essentially like why mm -hmm. is it checking there so we we should probably extract some of that stuff out you know from there and, and yeah. go check what's going on in our check check game over so yeah. yeah so this says if so the condition to check if the game is over which is checking 60 times a second is that if the score is equal to the number of targets which is the number of targets was up here as our uh 50 up here so if if the score equals 50 is what that's saying if the score is equal to 50 and game over is false so that means if game over is true ignore this but if game over is false at this point then make game over true set the game clock to zero and so we could put we could move that stuff into the game over function i think yeah. without too much muss or fuss cool yeah so yeah and, and those are you know i hopefully we didn't lose too many people in that um it's just the idea that you know things can be done in multiple different ways, and um, and there's always room for improvement on these. Uh, but the but the key idea really, so that we've the key things that we've done so far, right, is we did we set up a system to be able to collide objects and check when they're colliding, to be able to do something when that event happens, which in this case is primarily adding a score, and then the last thing that we've we've talked about, but maybe haven't addressed in detail, and maybe that would be the last thing to talk about is a little, just that, and we, we've, we've worked around it, is the, like the states of this game. Uh, you're playing it, and in the state where the game is not over, and then something, some special case happens when game is over, and what happens then. So that might be the thing to look at is, okay, so we've, we've got our score up to 50, and it's checking if game is over. Um, so what happens at that stage? What does the, how do, like, okay, game is over, so to speak, according to the code, what does it do? How does it get us back into that initial state? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, so that would be, and so this is the difference, I think, between a knit and a knit game, mm -hmm. you know, so that <clears throat> if we want to play the game again, we want to reset all of our game objects. We want to reset the hero's position. We want to reset up the targets. We want to reset the score. And so that's all stuff we can call an init game, but we don't want to reset this stuff. We could, but it's inefficient and clunky and could cause some weird stuff to happen. We yeah. just generally don't want to reset up the stage, for example, or the ticker, really. So we leave that stuff in init, and then we really basically want to call init game. So I don't know if I, this is set up that way, because I remember this was kind of clunky. This was just, so handle game over. 
Yeah. So handle game over calls init game. And so init game can be writ written to, um, and so what does init game does? What does init game do? It sets, it initializes our game variables. So um, you could probably take all of these things and, and put them into a function, you know, so that way you can kind of, you can check down the, this just resets everything to zero and null. And then it runs make background, make targets, make hero, make score tax, collision gnome, you know. Oh, by the way, if we set this to false, um, then we don't see the collision boxes. We just get the collision. So I'm going for my high score. All right. 50. Yes. So um, that's what the collision gnome debug does. So you could also just comment it out would be another way to do it. So you could just say true, leave it true, but then just comment it out so that it doesn't read it. Um, so draw a new frame. So what were we saying? I got distracted. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, no, it's good. No, I think that's exactly it. Just yeah. that we have a a uh, when the game is over, it runs that init game. And you know, you mentioned like if we go up to the init game and the init functions uh, right now, you know, there's not too much in our um, init function that would be such a big deal if it if it was redone. But uh, like when you said init game, but you could imagine like um, let's say you had more of like an arcade frame or something. So you had the you had. Um, information about like your player name and you had a uh, high scores and stuff like that could all be nested in the visual sort of frame to the game and then the, the actual playing space is in a smaller sort of inner uh, inner frame um, that would be a more obvious case where you wouldn't want to redraw everything because you would be overriding the like your you maybe you'd entered in your player name you had earned a high score um any other yeah. that kind of stuff you want that stuff to stay there but you want to be able to start the game again so that would be a, that would be a, a more obvious example of when you'd want to separate those things out yeah and the other one that we're going to talk about probably next week actually is preloading mm -hmm. that yep. next week we're going to get into this thing where we're going to start downloading our assets to the to the server i mean to the client side you know like so when someone goes to this website they're gonna all the the big files like the sound files are gonna be the biggest things we deal with those sound files you want to download those first and you don't want to start the game until those files have been downloaded or else the game won't work right so we have this other state called the preload which is like hang out just chill out until we've got everything preloaded and ready to go and then run init game. You know what I mean? Like, so it'll, we'll have these, and, and so what David is saying, that these are all what we would call different states, that the computer will be in a different state. And then this idea of a state, which is kind of like, you know, um, is a huge part, I think, of computer science. When you get, you can get really deep into this and like, you'll hear things described as a state engine, you know? And so we can think about this as like, like in a, in a video game, a character might have different states, like alive, dead, um, uh, casting, um, punching, like these would all be different states. And then you can think about the character's animation that would have different animation states as well. So there, it gets pretty complicated, you know, um, but we can think about our game as being kind of a state engine where th that the ticker that is just checking what state is the game in, what state is the game in, what state is the game in. So it's like, oh, it's in the play state. That means like move things, check for collisions, handle keys, all that kind of stuff. And then once the score is reached, it would say, oh, what state am I in? What state am I in? Oh, I'm in game over state. Okay, what do I do now? I set up game over, blah, 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 blah. like high scores, play again, question mark, set up a new button, clear everything off the stage, set up a reset button, you know what I mean? And then it would be like, Reset, oh, what state am I in now? Oh, I'm in init game. Oh, now I'm in play game, so, and so on and so forth. You can kind of just break it down as much as you want. 
Yeah. Well, we covered a lot of stuff today. Um, and, and, and hopefully it'll it, it's like, you can just keep thinking about it. Like, you know, we did here, like just keep thinking about, you know, zipping up these functions so you can just read them because they're designed to kind of be read in kind of plain English, you know, like check collisions, check boundary, check. So like all those checks are happening up here in the draw new frame or the game loop, you know, check collisions, check boundaries, check boundary. We don't have any checks going on in the game. We're just making or setting up, you know, so it could be like make background, make target. So the make functions are kind of happening here in any game. Now you could have make functions happening kind of as part of the game. So it could be like, if you fire a missile, you would then call a make missile function, you know, as part of the handle keys check. So that's that Russian nesting doll idea that you can, the more you can th think about these as like little building blocks or modules. That's what's kind of cool about functions is that they're really modular. They can go in different places and be used in different places to do different things. So. Yeah. Nice. Um, yeah. Well, let's see if there's any other questions and then um, I'm happy to answer those. And as we, as Miles mentioned, we'll be moving on to sort of preloading stuff and, getting some sounds happening with it. Um, and, um, and yeah, those are gonna be the main things. Um, I'm seeing, it looks like some people I know, or I know some people are still um, having some issues with Cyberduck. Um, that's been causing some, um, some headaches here and there. And admittedly, like even I've been doing this own, my own coding project for something over the last week, and I've been having some issues with that as well. Um, sometimes just, unusual login behaviors or it kicks me off a little more more than it typically did um so i don't know how much of that's just sort of like I don't, <laughs> in the air so to speak that's not a, not a real explanation um but a lot of times what happens the, the most common issues are connecting and then finding the um and getting the right address to your files um so on the connecting side um you know i know we have to get the key things to remember are the SFTP um, as a connection type um, and making sure that it's, you're connecting. The, well, maybe uh, should we look at it again real quick here? Yeah. Rather than me just saying it without a, you're like in a. Yeah, you want to do it? Yeah. Here, I'll try. Cool. Um, see, if my, see if mine will work. Okay, so we have Cyberduck up here. I was just trying to do stuff last night and was having some problems with it, so we'll, we'll see. Um, so I have a, a quick link to it here, but normally you could just, if you don't, you could just say open connection, choose SFTP, um, and server is going to be webpages.su.edu port, leave it at 22. Um, I know some people were, uh, were, I think we're doing a connection through a Chromebook or some other application and the port didn't default to 22 and they were having some errors. If they changed it to 22, it seemed to work. So that's something to check on. And your username, oops, um, and uh, password. I just had to change the password, my password to so make sure it's the most updated one and hit connect. And ah, retrying. Do it. Uh, yeah, I'm getting the problem that I occasionally get. This one I have no solution to, which is exactly what everyone wants to hear uh, from their instructor. Um, I, do, I, I do not know. Um, it's, it is, um, occasionally, and then it's just like, I try again and it, eventually it works. Um, well, that might be something we could take up with it too, probably individually. Cause sometimes there are just weird individual glitches, right? On accounts. I've noticed that over the years that, um, let me just try getting into my other one. Let's see if it'll let me in here. I can do mine too. Um, which will should should be I mean what's okay, it's logged in, so it's it's fine. 
So here, um, this, uh, well, let me just show you this and then maybe we should do miles so that you see that file structure again, so that rather, but, cool. but just the idea, this is the same, same thing. So this is on, this is the um, address for my davidbethel.com site. So if you want to check out some work that I've done, it's davidbethel.com. That's my website. So everything at www.davidbethel is in this public HTML folder. Um, and so like I have an about page, I have ones on some individual projects, I have some other stuff stored there that's, that's not really visible unless you know, know that it's there, all that kind of stuff. So this is like the structure, file structure of um, davidbethel.com, which is just this thing, which is fine, it needs to be updated, but it's got, you know, shows up about all my works and all that kind of stuff. So you see in here, for example, this is a page that where you can choose all the different works to look at of mine, davidbethel.com slash works.html. If we see that on Cyberdeck, we see we go into public HTML and then there's going to go down here somewhere and there's going to be a works.html file. That is the file that's being loaded. And then it might have images and things like that that it's using to show all that stuff. And those are going to be in the images folder. If it's using JavaScript, it's coming from the JavaScript folder, all that kind of stuff. So it's a similar structure, um, but it's not identical in terms of the, the address that you're going to get. So let's jump over now to, to Miles for the, uh, um, cool. for the web pages. One. So, yeah, let's see. So uh, first of all, to get ready, I think this is one of the problems people were having. I'll just kind of demo this. So this is our working code. It seems like it's all working. So I'll save this. And um, then, so right now it's got this kind of long, awful file name. So I'm going to close this. I'll close this. Close this. All right, just close it all up. So, um, and close that. And then if I go back to the desktop, um, there is, I go in here. So this is my project one four. What I can do is I can just change the name of this file to index.html. And so that's the same file. So if I open this back up in Sublime Text, you'll see it's, that's the file we were just working on. It's just called index now. And um, then I can upload this. And what I can also do is change this as a really super long name too. So I could just call this uh, project 1.4. And uh, so I've got project 1.4 and then index.html. So that's going to be my URL. So then I'll go to Cyberduck. And once that gets cooking here, there's Cyberduck open a connection. This is just like what David was saying, switch it to SFTP, uh, server web pages dot SOU dot edu. Username is my username. And then that's all set up and then connect. And then there's my public HTML folder. And then I've got things kind of set up this way. I'll just drag that in there so that's out of the way. All right. So I've got a 2020 folder that makes things easier for me to keep organized with, but I, I won't even, I'll just drag and drop it. So I've got project one for index.html. I drag this whole folder up here into the public HTML and takes a second. It's uploading and there it is. So now, um, that's my URL. My URL is going to be uh, blah, 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 project one four, and that's it. I don't have to put index.html. So if I go here to open this up, uh, it's going to be, uh, what is it? www. What is it? Web pages? Yeah, .sou, .edu, slash tilde minata, slash project one underscore four and that's it i don't have to put the index i don't have to put index because index is it's set up so that any folder that contains a file called index.html automatically knows to go open that first so it should work here 
And you saw when that page loaded, maybe that it was a little flash. It's because it took a second for it to, or a microsecond for it to download all that stuff. And that's what we're going to kind of get, like with the preload, we're going to wait and then play once the preload has happened. So, yeah. So our game is live. So you guys could type in that URL and play this game. So, which I'm sure you all want to do. Uh, so that's, that's kind of a recap of the uh, Cyberduck thing. But did I miss anything? Or is that, we can, we can look at people's individual pages if you're having trouble too, so. Yeah. Cool. All right, well, we can leave it there, I think. Uh, yep, and we'll check back in on Wednesday. So um, bring any issues that you have, of course, and um, any debugging that you want, or that's anything that's hanging you up, and we can do that one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, that's a good time to do that as well. Yeah. Cool. Yes, indeed. <laughs> um, all right. Yeah, any, any questions then from anybody? Um, David, I know we talked a little bit yesterday. Did you ever figure out what the issue was with my arrow keys? Yeah, um, good question. No, I... I apologize. I didn't get back to it last night. Oh, that's fine. Um, so, but let's, it was, let's see if there's um, actually, could you, sh I don't know, would, could you share? Do you have yours? Uh, yeah, no? just my coding. Yeah. Okay. Um, let me just pull it up. Almost that way we're looking at this latest version that you're working with rather than. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Um, and so everything was, you got everything kind of working. It's just that the key, um, the keyboard. Um, yeah. I, I looked at the new, like um, you made a couple edits and sent it back to me. And then I looked, I still um, can't see any of my targets, oh. the, the new ones that we're trying to add. Did it work for you? I was able to get it to work, yeah. So let's, uh, why don't you go ahead and scroll down and we'll start seeing where you're at. So in it, okay, in it game. Yeah, so stop there for a second. Okay, mark, so make targets, number of targets, and add child. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's go look at your make targets function. Okay, um, make targets, bitmap, and it adds it to the chart to the stage. So that's looking good. What? Okay. Um, and then why don't you go ahead and look at the um, the keyboard input section as well while we're down here. Okay. I'm just gonna pull up my, oops. at the same time so I can see where's our keyboard input on this one. That looks fine, right? Key monkey handle keyboard input. It is uh and that function is being called in your in your main loop, right? Um, so in the game loop. Here, I think. Yeah. Uh huh. Okay. That's good. That's working. Great. Um, what about? Yeah. Mm, those aren't. It's not obvious why those wouldn't be working to me. Um, let me go ahead and pull up. I'll pull up yours here, again. Um, Hi, Miles. Hey, Olivia. Hey. So your arrow keys are giving you trouble? Yeah. 
Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid arrow keys. Are the other keys working? Or is it like it will W or A or D work? Oh, yeah, those don't work either. Huh. And the targets aren't showing up, but they were on my end. So let me uh, see it here again. OK, great. Um, I think I did change the file name of one of your targets just because I uh, um, uh, was trying to get it to work locally without your thing. So yeah, I see target yeah. happening um, on my end. And do I have keyboard input working? No, keyboard input does a weird thing. It like jumps up to the top left corner. Does it do that on your end? Oh, that usually is because there's something's getting a faulty. There's probably the thing that's supposed to be moving is getting a faulty X, Y position. That almost always is why that happens. Uh, okay. Um, the thing that's supposed to be moving so, is giving a fault. So if it's the hero, is the hero jumping up? Is that what's happening? Yep. So that's probably going to be a problem in the something's. Uh, this happened last week actually with someone I was helping it with is that if you have something set up to um, yeah oh is this the uh, yeah so whatever is showing up there that is that is that flower thing is that the hero or that target the ladybug yeah so all right so if you go down back to the where is that ladybug? Oh, um, it's my hero. Okay, that's your hero. Okay, so let's look at the hero code. So the hero, it's set up. So it, when you reload it, does it jump there immediately? Or does it happen when you hit the arrow keys? It happens um, when I hit the arrow keys. Okay, so now go back to the code and go back to the call, the handle key. Um. Handle key, whatever it's called. Um, you mean down here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. So it's saying hero. So I think this is because hero dot speed might is probably doesn't exist. Uh, is my if, um, if, if it's getting a command that it doesn't exist, it's going to um, uh, not work. So we can either define hero dot speed when we set up the hero, or we can hard code it. Why don't we? Why don't we just go to where you, it, you set up the hero? There's Here. yeah, and then go there, and then uh, after hero dot y, just go next and go hero dot speed equals five or something. Yeah, save that. So you actually have some variables up top that are like hero start speed and yeah hero speed x and y, but they're not associated actually with hero speed. Nice catch. Yay. Oh, hey. <laughs> Thank you. That's cool. It looks great. Yeah, so far it's pretty cute. That'll be fun. Actually, that, you can set up the collision to work with that those that maze wall. That'll be neat. That's a good Yeah. Project. Yeah, that's going to be cool. Um and then what about my little make targets thing? Did you ever figure that out? Um, what what was happening with make targets? Um, it doesn't make any targets. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it, it's working on my end uh, when I load it, so I'm not sure. So what's what's supposed to be happening? Um, just trying to make some, just as the same way you guys had in the example last week, just to get them to show up. But those dots weren't the targets. No, those were from the week before. We had like target one, target two, target three. Okay. Okay, These so you're trying to do the, the random generated ones. And it's working for you, David? Yeah, it is. Weird. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not using, I don't have the same imagery. Um, so, do you, are you getting any errors in your console? I can't find target 03. Um, no, I don't have any errors. Or go back to the Chrome page oh, okay. and inspect it. Yeah, there you go. Go to the console. That's good. High in it, high in it game. Okay. 
Um, go back to your code. Go to the top, to the global variables. And let's see, so we have my stage, hero, ground, front of me, buddy. Target, 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 target. So do we have an array? Yeah, targets or, array. Oh, there it is, targets array. Okay, so go down, keep going down. And call and go to targets. make targets. Oh, go ahead, David. Yeah, 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 we call make targets on round 98 or so. Okay, keep going. So there's the call to make targets. Make targets, number of targets. Okay, go down, end init game, cool. So now go to the make targets function make targets how many targets four variable i equals zero i less than how many targets so is how many targets defined up at the top just go back up to the top look for the global variable section and there should be a variable called how many targets number of targets <laughs> ah so is that the is that the right number so 35 yeah go, i just want to make sure i got so number of targets is 25 yep. okay mm -hmm. go down i think that's right yeah that's so go back one. one yeah so the where's the call there? Oh, how it, many targets? Yeah, no, oh, that's the, that's the parameter. Right. Yeah, got you. I got you. So yeah. make targets is being called. Uh, where do we call make targets again? Um, make targets. Here. We're targets. Great. Okay. So we're all good. We're all good. Okay. So now down to one thirty. Whatever. Uh, okay. I plus plus targets array i equals new create JS bitmap images target o three. Reg X, Reg Y, X position, stage width, Y position, stage height. Okay. Speed X, speed Y, coin toss, my stage. Okay. So, <laughs> okay. I wonder. We could set a breakpoint in the code here to see if this is working the way we want it to work. Um, or, actually, um, or, or, or go to your desktop. Oh, go ahead, Dave. Yeah, a quick thing. Can you go back to Chrome and then click on the console? Um, yeah, up there. And then can you just type in the word or type in targets array? Oh, yeah. Um, with the capital, so that the one that it's trying to autocomplete. Oh. Yeah, and so it has 25 things in there, it looks like. Yeah, open that up. Enter. Yeah, can you open that up there, that yeah. arrow? If that you, no, if you just, you need to hit enter oh. after the word, and then it will. There oh, you go. Cool. Now you can pull that open, the thing below it. And so those should be all those. And let's click into one of them and just make sure it looks like it's an, it's a, Image thing, image, regex, reg. -y. Open up the image image property of that list. There's that long list. There should be some. It says image. Open that up. Um, yeah, it's up a little. Do you high. guys see it? Uh, yep, yeah. yeah, it's up. They're up a few more. There you go. Alphabetical image. Oh. And open the arrow. And then there should be something that says keep going down. SRC maybe for source or wait there's a base uri okay there's a current image source that i saw something yeah keep going down all right uh source file c users illuminating desktop target 03.png okay so it's finding it all right so it's there is okay. uh is your background um transparent could they just be behind your background and you can't see it? Or are they, is it? Um, it, I think it's opaque, but everything is like coded on top of the background. Okay, but I can well, try any way to make it transparent. Yeah, well, why don't you try just on your code if you just comment out your background and let's just see if it's magically behind your background. Okay. Um, where did I put that? Oh. Because that would be a reason why it would work on mine, but not on yours, because I'm using a background image that doesn't, or actually no background image was showing up, I think. Um, that might, let's see, that way might give it an 
Hey. 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 Okay, so why, if it's coated on top, why is it still behind it? Yeah, well, it depends on when the code is called to be when it's, if, it, if the add child for the background happens at some point after the add child for the make targets happens. So let's see where, what the order of that is. So where do you add the child? So, so un, go ahead and uncomment or uncomment that line so we get it, the ground back happening. Okay, and scroll down. And there you go. So add your, so put that make targets call after you do those other things. Oh. Because, so like yep. the, right after add child buddy. Wait. Yeah, after 106, go to one, end of 106 and make a new line. Yeah. Cool. So this is number one? Uh, no, ground is first. Ground is added first at 100. Line 100 is the first thing that gets added. So that's your background. And then 101, then 102, 103, 104. And so since add child is part of make targets, that's why it was adding it first and then it was running ground. But now it'll run it oh. after it all. Yeah. Oh, okay. Cool. This is fun. This is good. I think cool. I get it. <laughs> nice. Does it work? Yay. Thank you. Yay. There you go. That's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. All right. Cool. Have a good day, guys. All right. Cheerio. So, David, we have a BFA review. It looks um, like we do. <laughs> um, I can go to that and I can say if, if you're going to be a minute, if, if there are people still have questions or something, or you, know, you can just drop in. That's fine. Yeah, and I'll drop in. The meeting. I think, like, yeah, since you're, and I'll, uh, I'll check out here, but uh, you guys can rock and roll. Nice. Okay. Great. Cool. Thanks. Bye, everybody. Oh, yeah. Any other questions or uh, for anyone that's remaining, or if you want to? try and debug anything individually, we certainly can. Or we can also wait till Wednesday. Oops, no. Okay. Great. Well, um, thanks everyone. And we will be in touch soon. We'll see you on Wednesday, if not before. Nice. Thanks. See you, Rad. <laughs>